Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spirit rock, spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfilment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. This is the word of the Lord. In Numbers, and it's chapter 25. While Israel was staying at Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped, but those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. The Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was zealous for my honour among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore tell him, I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honour of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. The name of the Israelite who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, the leader of a Simeonite family. And the name of the Midianite woman who was put to death was Cosbi, daughter of Zur, 
a tribal chief of a Midianite family. The Lord said to Moses, Treat the Midianites as enemies and kill them. They treated you as enemies when they deceived you in the Peor incident involving their sister Cosby, the daughter of a Midianite leader, the woman who was killed when the plague came as a result of that incident. This too is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, good to be with you. Uh, I'm encouraged that Rod is coming and speaking next week because I sort of thought that makes me number two, doesn't it? So if I muck up or you think this guy's not very good, you look forward to Rod. And if I'm okay, you still look forward to Rod. You think if he's better than, than his assistant, that's a good thing, isn't it? Um, we're looking at uh, Numbers, which is a great book, isn't it? And let me see if this works. Yep, we're uh, in Numbers 25. I wonder if you've ever had those experiences where things aren't what they seem. Uh, for me, a, a small example, but last week I was at a conference uh, with Andy and I thought, I need something other than the normal range of chocolate and cakes and sweets, much as I love them. I, I just longed for a piece of fruit. And there was a beautiful apple there, and I thought, that's what I need. Took a bite, and, and you know what it's like, don't you? You know, you just think, oh, this is awful. It was just all brown inside. And you have that sense, don't you, that something looks good, but on the inside, maybe it's not so good after all. And uh, into the bin it went. Uh, maybe you've had times like that. Maybe it's fruit, you know, food. But what if it's people? People who look good on the outside, but on the inside you just think that heart of sort of brown mush, like my apple. And what if it was God who wasn't what he seemed on the outside? And so today we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at, what, firstly, what are people really like? Secondly, what is God really like? And thirdly, how do we, how do we bridge that difference, that gap between us? Uh, so let's pray as we think about God's word. Our gracious God and loving Father, we thank you that you are still at work in your world. We thank you for your word, your word of truth and life. And we ask now that your spirit would guide us into your word, that he would open our ears and our hearts, that we might uh, hear your word, believe it, and become more like Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible, uh, it would be helpful to turn to uh, Numbers 25. And I hope that you've enjoyed the journey through Numbers. I think it's great to go back to the Old Testament, isn't it? Uh, so rarely do we do that, and yet so much good stuff there. So uh, Numbers 25. Last week, uh, you were on the mountaintop. And God refused to curse his people but was instead steadfastly faithful, wasn't he, to his promise to bless them. No matter what Balaam did, God said, no, no, I'm going to bless my people. And it's a great picture, isn't it? And I imagine that if we had met Israel at that time living under God's blessing, we would have met, or we would have thought that we would meet, a people living godly and obedient lives, a holy people worshipping God. An extraordinary God who blesses them. That's the right response, isn't it? And today, friends, we do meet them. And it's not a pretty picture. As happens often in the Bible, after those great mountaintop experiences, after the highest highs come the lowest lows. Because that's the reality, isn't it? Think the golden calf. Think David and Bathsheba. Think Numbers 25. Now, there is Israel. They're camped on the plains of Moab, opposite Jericho. Uh, there's a little uh, photo for you. Uh, it's their last campsite before they cross across the Jordan River into Jericho. As Andy said, you've got to wait till Joshua before it happens. There's lots more to come. But that's where they are. They can see it. Look, it's just over there. Here's the promised land, as God has promised us. But the low comes. Verses 1 to 6 of our passage, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before their gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. 
The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. This is an awful picture, isn't it? Here is the brown mush of Israel's heart exposed for all to see of the community in general breaking God's laws. Commandment number one, you shall have no other God but God, broken. Commandment number two, no idols, broken. Commandment number seven, do not commit adultery, broken. God's words in Exodus 34, don't join in with the religious practices of the nations around you, broken. And this is the generation who heard it, who saw Moses on the mountaintop. And as you read Numbers, it's intriguing that the Midianite women, and that should read Numbers 31, just in case you're wondering, the Midianite women who are leading the men away from God are doing so at Balaam's advice. Balaam, the guy who was trying to get God to curse them, works out that I have a plan to lead Israel's men astray, to make them commit sin and abandon their God. This is Balaam doing this. Highlighted by this couple in verse 6, isn't it, who, who brazenly commit sin in the midst of the people, despite all that God has said. What are people really like? This is what they're really like, isn't it? Ignoring God and disobeying God and thinking, God doesn't punish sin, so I'll just do whatever I want. Friends, this is Israel then and this is us now. In case you haven't noticed, sexual immorality is everywhere, isn't it? Our society is so highly sexualized. Uh, at our conference the other week, one of our speakers talked about his wife, who is a Christian psychologist and uh, working in Sydney's West, and she says, I've heard it all. I've heard about what men do to women and what men do to men and what women do to men and what women do to women. And she said, it's a train wreck. Relationships are messed up because of sexual issues. The devil perverts that good gift of God seeking to lead people astray, just like he used Balaam. Uh, and sadly, Christians are not immune. Uh, a bishop who interviews young Bible college graduates who are heading out into full-time ministry told me that a generation ago, the problem for most young men was alcohol. And now it's pornography. And I know as we interview people, they tick the box, yes, I've struggled with pornography. See, God says that sex is good within the boundaries that I set. And the evil one says sex is good, forget about the boundaries. Get as much as you can, how often you can, with whoever you can, because God is just a killjoy. And friends, the devil is a liar and a deceiver. What are God's good boundaries when it comes to sex? It's be careful what you look at, isn't it? In the old days, it was don't watch SBS. <laughs> they always had dodgy movies on. And now it's pornography available on any device. And I want to say if you're caught up in it, please stop and repent. Find someone to help you be accountable. Find software for your devices. There's lots of ways you can control what you see. And God says, be careful about your relationships, doesn't he? If you're in a sexual relationship outside of marriage, God says, stop and repent. Now, whether it's sex before marriage, whether it's adultery, whether it's homosexual behaviour, whether it's marrying an unbeliever, they all dishonour God. And it's hard words to hear, isn't it, in a society that says anything goes. And God says, no, no, separate until such time as you can honour God in the way you live. And if you're married, 
God's word is to honour God and your spouse with your body. Which means avoid non-consensual sex, forced sex, abuse. It all dishonours God, doesn't it? So stop and repent and get help if those things are an issue for you. Numbers 25 shows us how serious God takes those matters. Uh, Paul says in our second reading, doesn't he, there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, learn the lessons. Numbers is a ripping story, learn the lessons. Don't commit sexual immorality. Flee idolatry. Don't think, how close can I go to the edge? Because you'll fall off. But Paul says, flee in the other direction. Run away. We'll hear later about God's forgiveness to those who truly repent. But I want to say there are great positives to being sexually pure. That we have as Christians an incredible opportunity to show the world the difference that knowing Jesus makes, don't we? That we have God's spirit of power and holiness. The spirit who can help us live out God's ways and show the world something better. To show the world that singleness and chastity can be a great joy and blessing and not just frustration and disappointment. To show the world that godly marriages are good compared to some of the ruined relationships we see around us. It takes hard work, but we have a great opportunity and we have God's spirit to help us. Let us show the world the good difference that Jesus makes. Let us celebrate those long marriages, you know, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, is a testimony to God and his goodness, isn't it? We should rejoice and hold each other up. Sexual immorality is a curse, but it's actually a symptom of something deeper of idolatry, Paul says. Replacing the true God with a false one. For the Israelites, it was Baal the fertility god of the Canaanites, the people around them, thinking that they would be blessed if they committed sexual immorality, that, that Baal would bring rain and good crops and wealth. And so they yoked themselves to Baal. It's a terrible word, isn't it? That sense of being burdened by something. Well, then being burdened by sin and idolatry. Why would people do that? Abandon the true God and take on a false God. Why, why would you do that? People do it today, don't they? And I wonder if maybe it's because they don't think God is what he seems. That God's heart is not good. So point three, I think there are people out there that think that God is a killjoy. That God is just a God who sets lots of rules to stop me doing what I want. Do not, do not, do not, restricting my freedom. And people might think God looks all right on the outside, you know, this little grandfatherly figure who's all night, but inside his heart is to stop me doing what I want. And Numbers 25 might reinforce that, mightn't it? But let me ask you, as you heard it read, were you more horrified by the sins of the Israelites or were you more horrified by God telling Moses to kill people? It's interesting, isn't it? Which is your idea of God? Kill the leaders. God says they're corporately responsible. This is a community problem. They are the leaders who have let it go on. That Israelite man who sinned so blatantly, he was the son of a leader. His father didn't restrain him. Kill the leaders to turn God's anger away from the rest of the people of Israel. Show them how serious sin is. Show them that holiness matters to God. But Moses doesn't, does he? Extraordinary. This man of God doesn't do what God asks. Maybe he's grown weak. Maybe he fears a revolt. The leaders will have it in for me. So instead he tells the leaders, kill the people who were involved. And it's awful. And the community weeps at the thought of it. 
All those people. And so they don't do anything. And so God acts instead. A plague comes and verse 9, 24,000 people die. That's the extent of the sin. I, I think most of them, if not all of them, are the remnant of that first generation who came out of Egypt whom God said wouldn't enter the land because of their sin and 40 years on they're still the same, aren't they? And they don't enter the land. The old generation ends and chapter 26, our next chapter, a new census, a new beginning, a new generation. But will they be any better? Well, you can find out. God acts, doesn't he, because God is angry at sin. And rightly so. We, we actually want a God who punishes sin, that people who wrong me, God should do something about. Except I forget that I've wronged people as well. Because God is truly is jealous for his honour. It's a strange sort of word, isn't it, that we tend to think jealousy is bad. But God is jealous for himself. Uh, when we worship something else or someone else's God, it takes away honour from God. So imagine I said to you, I painted that painting that won the Archibald Prize this year. That, that, that was mine. Did you know that? How do you think the real artist feels? <laughs> Robbed of honour. No, that, that was me. It's how God feels. All the blessings that you have and that I have come from God. And we say, oh, that came from Baal. No wonder he gets angry. God is jealous for his honour and he wants us to be as well. And so we hear about Phineas. The Israelite man comes in with the Midianite woman and when Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my anger from the Israelites. Since he was as zealous for, uh, for my honour among them as I am, I didn't put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore tell him I'm making a covenant of peace with him, he and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honour of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Uh, Phineas is one of the new generation. Aaron's grandson, remember Aaron? He's a priest. And unlike the oldies, he's zealous for God and his honour. And so he kills the sinners seemingly while they are in the very act of it and the plague ends and God is pleased. He has turned away God's anger and made atonement for the Israelites. Sin can only be atoned for by blood. And so God's covenant promises come to him, don't they? And our chapter ends with the Midianites uh, condemned as Israel's enemies. And if you look to chapter 26, you see the devastation on the tribe of Simeon as their numbers are cut from the first census, not as many of them left. Friends, Numbers shows us, doesn't it, that God is holy and righteous and jealous and he hates sin and yet he is compassionate and merciful. He doesn't like bringing his anger and his wrath. Once Phineas has acted, God's anger is quenched. His holiness, his justice are driven by a heart of love that longs to show mercy and grace to a people who sure don't deserve it, do they? Which brings us to us. The Israelites are not the only sinful, disobedient people, are they? I am. And you are. We all have rotten hearts. And whether it's sexual immorality for us or whatever sin, we are the same. That idolatry of self or leisure or pleasure or work or wealth or family. Humanity hasn't changed, has it? 
we all sin and fall short of God's glory. And God hasn't changed either. He still cannot stand our sin. And death comes. Punishment, blood is shed. And so we cry out, don't we? Who can bridge that divide for us as Phineas did for Israel? We can't do it by ourselves. And we don't want to face the wrath of God. How will atonement be made for me? And for you, it's where the gospel is such good news, isn't it? That there is one who will stand in the gap for us. That there is one who is even more zealous for God's honour than Phineas was. That there is one willing to act against sin and that is the Lord Jesus. Who doesn't take other people's lives with a spear, but instead is pierced, giving his own life for us. Do you see how serious sin is? That Jesus, God's son, had to die. And now our sin is atoned for. This is great news. As we confessed our sin earlier, this is the grounds of our sureness, isn't it? Our assurity. Those great words from Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement there's our word, isn't it? Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Friends, Numbers 25, I hope you've seen as you go through Numbers, it's real. This really happened. This is history. This isn't just a story. God's people committed sexual immorality and idolatry and 24,000 of them died. It's a terrible story. And it's recorded for us as a warning to us Unless the same happened to us because it can. The temptations of the world and the flesh and the devil are strong, aren't they? And the devil keeps trying to seduce us. Forget about God. Trust something else. Live for something else. Worship something else. So friends, I want to say let us be warned. Say no to temptation. It's hard to do, but we have the Spirit of God. What is it that you need to be doing to say no to those temptations that assail you and to worship God instead? What do you need to be doing to be more zealous for God than for temptation? Maybe we need to keep coming back to his word and prayer and meeting together and encouraging one another. We need to be different from the world. The world won't like us being different. <laughs> It hates us being different because it makes them look bad. But let us be different. Let us take sin seriously and repent where we need to and to come back to the cross of Jesus and find their forgiveness and atonement and strength for the journey to find redemption and reconciliation and peace with God. To say yes to holiness through the gift of his spirit. Friends, let us come back to Jesus and find God's grace and love for sinners even like me and even like you. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Father, we are so thankful for your care for us in giving us your word which provides warnings for us, warnings like today. Father, please help us to take them seriously to see that sin matters enough to send Jesus to the cross, to see that we matter enough to send Jesus to the cross. Father, help us to repent where we need to and please strengthen us where we need strengthening, to keep living for Jesus, that we might honour him and be zealous for you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for him and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in him. 
And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. is kind of more traditional service. 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. we have children's programs or 6 p.m. Uh, in the evening that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.